beyond environmentally efficient, sustainable, and desirable future. I'm really excited about this, this seminar series because I think this is a really important topic, one that um, hasn't, doesn't get enough attention and needs to really start focusing on, on this particular issue. Hopefully today I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you why. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob Costanza, Director of the Economic Institute for Ecological Economics in the Berkeley State School. Um, subsequent information and about this class uh, will be on the link at this website. This website so we'll, go there. <coughs> we'll have some of the background meetings that we have for the course, and uh, hopefully some of the uh, tapes of the, of the subsequent talks. So, if you want to see, uh, go there and, and pick it up. Um, it, it may be a slight delay. It may take us a little while to get there. Um, we sort of came to this topic um, partly as a response to this essay that came out, um, I think it was last year or so, by Michael Schellenberger and Ted Norris, the, the Death of Environmentalism. This caused quite a ruckus, I think, in the environmental community. And not everything that they said in the essay um, is valid, uh, but I think they have one important point um, that needs to be made and needs to be picked up on. <clears throat> they basically identify this critical missing element in the whole environmental movement. That they, in their words, not one of America's environmental leaders is articulating a vision of the future <coughs> with the magnitude of the crisis. So the environmental movement has been up until now, um, presenting a fairly negative vision. Negative in the sense of, here are the problems. Um, here's all the things that are going wrong. And unless we solve those problems, um, it'll be in bad shape. Uh, but they've never or haven't yet uh, sufficiently came to the other side of the, the coin. What, what is a better world? What is a positive vision of the future? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and I think that's what we're trying to achieve in this, in this seminar. Um, we have, I think, a really good lineup of people to, to address that topic. And I think it's our joint challenge uh, to really create that shared vision of a sustainable and desirable future. So that's what the object of, our, of this seminar series is. How do we move beyond this negative environmentalism of the past create this positive, <coughs> detailed, and shared vision of a sustainable and desirable future. I think all of those words are important. Um, positive, for sure, detailed in the sense that it has to be well enough articulated so that, that people can understand what we're talking about. Make an abstract vision about percentage of energy that's coming from wind power, for example. Uh, we have to explain <coughs> to people what life would be like this sustainable and desirable future, and how that life would actually be better uh, than it is now or than it would be in alternative uh, visions of the future. And I think that that is the case. The, um, and often um, solving environmental problems is, is presented as requiring sacrifice. Uh, we have to give something up. Uh, we have to stop driving as much. We have to stop doing this and that. Uh, well, that may be true, but in return for, for doing, making those changes, we're getting positive gains in terms of our quality of life that more than outweigh uh, the other things that we're having to reduce. So I think we need to present the picture of how our quality of life would actually improve uh, in the future in order to get uh, the public on board, in order to get uh, any real change to happen. This is the lineup that we have. I have a few printed copies of this down here as well. And we've been a little late in getting, uh, getting all these people to commit to dates and getting organized, so you probably haven't seen uh, the, full, the full list yet. And we'll get this uh, spread around campus a little more broadly as we go. Um, <clears throat> several people <clears throat> from here at the university and also from, uh, from Middlebury, including Bill McKinnon, Josh Barley, uh, Dan Fungle is going to come and give a talk. Um, 
and several very well-known people from, from elsewhere, including uh, Rick Mewins, who was the, uh, the leader of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, Scenarios, uh, Ernest Kallenbach, who was the, uh, the author of uh, Ecotopia, which many of you, some of you may have read. Who's, who's read that novel? Uh, really old, old ones. Um, <laughs> it came out in the 70s, but it's, it's an amazing uh, piece of work. It's just been reissued. And uh, it was one of the first <clears throat> attempts, I think, to, to really paint this, this picture the way that I'm talking about, as a narrative, as a novel. Uh, Ernest will pull it bit. It's not a great, um, not a great writer. It's not a great piece of literature. But it is um, an interesting attempt to, to do what we're trying, what we're talking about doing. Um, it's amazing that it has the last. Um, you can see some of the other people on the list. That you may know Richard Heinberg who here as a presidential uh, speaker as well. He's going to give a separate talk in this seminar about the. Uh, <coughs> energy in a sustainable and desirable future. Um, we have Mary Elvin Tucker talking about the relationship between religion, religion and ecology and sustainability. Um, Lynn Ostrom is the former president of the American Political Science Association. He's done uh, a huge amount of work on uh, common property resources and <coughs> social capital kind of issues. Uh, David Orr, I'm sure you're familiar with it from before, <coughs> is now we don't know a, uh, a professor at large that could be appointed as a professor at large if he's going to be here for a couple of weeks a year or during this stay and we'll give him a talk about it or something. So, <clears throat> why is vision important? Well, it turns out from studying a number of different fields that in, actually, in order to actually solve problems, you have to have an adequate vision, both of how the world works, how your situation works, and also what your goals are, how you would like the world to be. Uh, we're going to be focusing in this seminar series on both aspects of the business, of that vision, uh, but, but all fairly strongly on the, the second aspect, how we would like the world to be, what would a sustainable and desirable future actually look like. And I've been having some trouble convincing all of the speakers that that we need to have this positive approach. Because the first tendency is to say, well, here's the way it is. Now, this is the situation. And it looks bleak. And you know, unless we do something, uh, things are going to really be bad. Well, that's all true. But <clears throat> what do we do? And so convincing people to think more positively and take this next step into how do we really want it? <coughs> Why is that important? Well, unless you have a clear goal, um, it's very hard to to achieve. Uh, and as, as Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. So what are the, what are our goals? How do we really articulate those goals? It's over there, but it's not over here. So as, as scientists, we generally tend to focus on the tools and analytical techniques and how we, understand, how we analyze these problems, but those things need to be appropriate to the vision as does the implementation strategy that we use. So lacking this positive vision, the shared vision of what our goals are, uh, we end up spinning our wheels off and, and doing things that are not, not really the most appropriate to help us actually achieve those, those goals. Um, so, Here's the default vision, I think, that, that is out there in the world today, which you might call the empty world vision. The idea that there are, um, and this is, this came about 
for good historical reasons in the past, and their artifacts were a relatively small component of this larger finite global ecosystem. There was always a frontier. There was always room for expansion of that, of that subsystem uh, out into the world. Uh, so the empty world um, vision um, doesn't see limits to the, to the growth of that uh, economic subsystem. Uh, of course, the reality has, has changed quite dramatically, especially in the last few years. Where <coughs> um, humans and their artifacts are now a, a huge presence. Um, this is nighttime satellite uh, imagery uh, composited onto this screen as well. So you can see uh, how many, uh, what the human influence is on, on the planet. Of course, from the empty world point of view, this is, this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. This is an actual ad that I got out of an in-flight magazine from Alabama Power. You can't read the caption down there. It says, with electricity, with electricity prices at least 15% below the national average, why not? Why not turn all the lights on and you know, make it even <laughs> So instead of looking like, you know, like this, it's going to start looking like that. And in fact, the empty world vision sort of leads one in that direction. That's, that's the vision of the, of the future. More and more and more and more is better. Um, and there's nothing in that vision that would uh, restrict the, the unlimited growth of the, the material economy. So what does the economy look like from the perspective of the, this empty world uh, vision? Well, there's land, labor, and capital, the traditional primary factors of production, but uh, you can see that land is kind of grayed out because there's this assumption of there's perfect substitutability between these factors. So that if we run out of land and natural resources, uh, we just substitute more capital and labor and uh, keep the economy growing, keep GNP growing. Um, <coughs> And that uh, individual utility and welfare is, is a function almost exclusively of this consumption of goods and services. So the more we produce, the better. Uh, we have to, to take some of our production and reinvest it in building the capital stock so that we can consume more in the future. But there's nothing in this vision of the world that can in any way limit that uh, increase in production uh, indefinitely. So this is the vision of of, uh, that I think dominates a lot of our policy discussions, a lot, a lot of our uh, political decisions. Um, but it's not the vision that's consistent with uh, what we now know about how the world works, about the reality of, of uh, the magnitude of the human presence in the biosphere and the, and the kinds of impacts that we need to have on our ecological life support system. So because of rising population, because and because of that, and other activities were beginning to have measurable effects on all of the global material cycles, uh, the nitrogen cycle, on the number of species um, on the planet, and, uh, and many other things. Um, so, a lot of that is driven most of that is driven by our consumption of fossil fuels. As this graph shows, um, since 1800, 1850, our consumption of fossil fuels has just gone through the roof. And you can see there's kind of a, a kink there in uh, 1950, just in the post World War II period, right here. And this is true of a lot of different trends in, in human activity. Uh, uh, been what someone called the Great Acceleration of that. Um, on the other hand, well, yeah, this shows the, the spatial distribution of uh, world oil reserves in red and the remaining uh, oil stocks in black. Uh, so you can see where the oil was originally and where, um, where there's still oil stocks remaining. You can see that the U.S. had a huge oil stock at the beginning of the century, but we've consumed a large fraction of those. And the countries with large remaining oil stocks uh, in the Middle East, largely, and, uh, and Russia, were the subject of 
conflict of interest reason. Now, it's also true that uh, the production of oil um, will probably peak uh, sometime. Some think it already has been. Uh, if not, uh, sometime in the not too distant future. This graph is showing a peak at around 2010. The latest set of scenarios for the oil and camp. And it also shows the distribution of um, the oil production, both now and in the future. You see what a big chunk of that the Middle East represents, the Middle East and uh, Russia. So the question becomes, <clears throat> what happens after, after oil production peaks? Um, Richard Heinberg is going is to speak <coughs> to that issue and talk later, uh, later in the series. What happens after the party's over? Uh, how do we create a sustainable energy um, future. Um, part of the vision element is also visualization. How do we, how do we actually um, perceive some of the complex processes that, that are um, underlying our ecological life support system, that are underlying uh, the, the, the complex structures that, that support us. This is a, um, a model of the climate showing in white uh, relative humidity and orange precipitation. It, it gives you in one place a fairly good picture of how this complex system works. Um, what's, what's also interesting about it is it is a model. It's, a, it's a, um, an abstract representation that synthesizes a huge amount of uh, information, data, knowledge about the system and allows us to speculate about what would happen if things change, what would happen if we increase the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. Or change language patterns, etc. Um, so our ability to understand those patterns is, is improving rapidly. Our ability to observe, in this case, primary productivity on the planet in a, in a relatively dynamic way, and to uh, understand the patterns that that uh, cause that primary productivity and what, what how it would change, how it might change under different alternative scenarios. Uh, the now, the climate is certainly a, a key component of what's going to happen to the future environment and to the future of civilization. And this graph shows that um, while the climate has been relatively stable over the last thousand years, um, just in the last hundred years, during that period when we put all the CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, we've had a noticeable, measurable increase in the global average temperature, in this case in the northern hemisphere. And all of the model results, like the one I was showing, uh, indicate that there will be continued uh, increases in temperature. Um, the exact amount is, is still uncertain. Uh, but you can see from this graph what the, what the range of possibilities are. <clears throat> so the vision now of how the world works has to acknowledge that we live in the full world, not living in the empty world. Uh, humans and their artifacts are a major <coughs> component. And therefore, we have to study this whole system as an integrated whole. And we have to, to uh, establish new goals. The goals can no longer be simply grow, uh, as they have been in the past. And, and which may have been appropriate in, this em in the empty world context, uh, but are certainly no longer uh, appropriate now. That continued growth is not necessarily uh, going to give us uh, improvement in quality of life. In fact, there are many. Uh, measurements that show that, that our quality of life is now suffering, is degrading, um, partly because of uh, the continued growth in the, in the economic system, at least in the overdeveloped countries in the, in the north. <coughs> so here's a more complex, more, um, more detailed, and I would argue more appropriate model in this full world context, uh -huh. where we acknowledge that um, there is not perfect substitutability between these four major factors of production. Uh, manufactured capital as before, labor, and human capital, uh, but also natural capital and social capital, or the interactions between people and uh, their networks, both formal and informal. Um, and that all four of those types of capital contribute to human well-being and the sustainability of that well-being in very complex ways, both as contributors to the conventional economic production process, but also um, directly uh, without ever going through the market system. Uh, they, 
provide ecosystem goods and services. Um, people benefit from being part of the community. Um, and so we have to consider all four of those types of capital. We're talking about uh, desirability in the future, having a high quality of life. And certainly we need to worry about, uh, in particular, the natural capital. We're talking about sustainability, but I think all of those forms of capital contribute to the sustainability question. We have to acknowledge that um, we live in a materially finite, uh, closed planet. And uh, uh, there's no way that the economy, the material economy, can continue to grow indefinitely on that, uh, on that finite planet. So unless we start you know, shipping people and uh, manufacturing operations off to other planets, which doesn't seem likely in the immediate future, uh, then we have to live within those material constraints of the the planet that we have. So <clears throat> if our goals are sustainable human well-being, a sustainable and desirable future, uh, all four of these forms of capital um, contribute uh, in very significant ways and in fairly, fairly balanced ways. And we have to understand what those contributions are and how to um, sustain and maintain all of our capital assets that we uh, rely on. So several of our speakers are going to talk to various aspects of those, um, those four types of capital. Another way of looking at this is uh, if we take the empty world vision and the full world vision, they have some underlying assumptions uh, built into them. Um, the empty world vision assumes that resources are unlimited, that um, technical progress can solve, uh, can solve any problem, that there are no real frontiers, basically. The world will continue to be empty. If not in material terms, then um, maybe in other terms, in information terms, in technical terms. But there's nothing in the empty world vision that limits the, the expansion of the economy and the increase in the production of goods and services. The full world vision is one that assumes that resources are limited, that we won't find a technical fix to all of our problems. And so we have to deal with uh, some of these what we call such problems. <clears throat> what if the, if the optimists are right? What if the full world vision or assumptions is actually correct? Then we end up in a future that, that I've called Star Trek, which is kind of the conventional vision of the future. We don't want to expand it indefinitely. Uh, the problem is, if those assumptions are not correct, we end up in the world called Mad Max. Not a very nice thing. Place to be. Uh, if the full world assumptions are assumed and policies are built on those, and, we, and those assumptions end up being correct, I'm, I'm sorry, if those assumptions end up being false, then we end up in the big government uh, world, where the government's sort of getting in the way of progress and slowing down the rate of growth and things like that. But if we take these assumptions and vision and Full world assumptions are true, then we end up in the ecotopia of the world. Um, and I think our challenge, this is also uh, fairly consistent with the, the, the scenarios, the four visions of the future that the <coughs> ecosystem assessment recently uh, produced. Um, and they gave them different names. You see that there. So it's, um, instead of big government, it's global orchestration. Instead of Mad Max, it's border from skin. Instead of Ecotopia, it's adapting mosaic and techno garden instead of Star Trek. And they're plotting the net change in human well-being um, in each of these four scenarios. You can see that the Mad Max or border from strength scenario is the one of the four that's really to be avoided. That's where human well-being actually declines, particularly in and that the um, ecotopia, or what they're calling the adaptive mosaic uh, scenario, is actually the most the most preferable. <coughs> in their this is uh, Rick Lehman's will be here on February 2nd, coming up pretty soon, uh, who is responsible for the Millennium Assessment Scenarios section to talk about uh, those scenarios and scenario building in general. Both as part of the climate change community and uh, as part of the assessment. Um, so we put in more details. 
those results are, are also fairly consistent with some uh, surveys that we did um, where we read narrative descriptions of these four future worlds, each independently, and then asked people to assess how desirable they would find living in that, in that sort of world. I'm not comparing them with the other world, but just say, you happen to find yourself in a Star Trek world, how desirable would that be? It's still a nice thing. Plus, the results that you get. And you can see if Mad Max is really the world to be avoided. Uh, the other three are, are desirable to some extent, but the Ecotopia world seemed to be the most desirable. <laughs> Millennium assessment uh, scenarios. <clears throat> so um, that that world, I think, the, uh, the ecotopia world, the sustainable and desirable world, I think, is the one that we need to flesh out in more detail. <clears throat> and I think that's the the, uh, the program, the agenda for this for this seminar series. How do we create a more uh, detailed picture of what that world might look like. We already have some good evidence, I think, that that, that world would actually be preferable to, um, I would argue, a majority of people uh, if it were uh, presented and, and framed in the appropriate way. Uh, and the problem is it hasn't been uh, framed and presented and articulated and distributed um, you know, in a wide enough, to a wide enough audience in, in the appropriate way. Uh, Danella Meadows, who many, many of you um, may know, may have known, um, was very active in this process of, of uh, envisioning and um, trying to understand how the envisioning process works and what the elements of that process were and how we could do a much better job of, of uh, using envisioning to help solve our problems. She gave a talk at <coughs> a conference that that uh, helped organize it in Costa Rica in 1994. And the, her, her paper was published in 1996, this book, um, that talks about just that question. How do we envision a sustainable world? And I happen to have a videotape of that, that talk from the conference, which we'll, we'll put up on the website if anybody's interested in uh, taking a look at that talk. Which she basically goes over several of these elements principles for effective envisioning. How do you actually do a good job of envisioning? Uh, and I'll just go through them quickly. So you first need to, um, to focus on what you really want and not what you'll settle for. So she has a little table of things you might really want and things you might settle for. What we really want are self-esteem, serenity, health, happiness, home, and concern. Uh, what we're getting right now are you know, fancy cars, drugs, medicine, GMP, unsustainable growth. Those are, those are poor substitutes for what we, what we really want. So we have to focus on what you really want, and not necessarily the means to do that. GMP is a means to an end, it's not an end in itself. Uh, but in fact, we're mistaking it as, as an end in itself. Any of our policy decisions these days. Um, you should judge the vision by the clarity of its goals, not the clarity of its implementation plan. And this is an important one, because often <coughs> we say, you know, the first thing you say when somebody starts talking about their vision and the future, like, well, that could never happen. There's no, I can't see any path for us to get from, from here to there. And so it's important that you um, create the goals, that you clearly lay out the goals, what, what that future should look like. Um, before <clears throat> starting to worry about how to get there. That it has to acknowledge but not get crushed by the physical and political constraints of the real world. So it's some, maybe somewhat of a, a corollary uh, to number two. Uh, <clears throat> yes, there are constraints, but uh, don't let them completely uh, crush the vision. It's critical for visions to be shared because only shared visions can be responsible. I think this is a, maybe the most important point, <clears throat> that um, how do we create a shared vision? How do we begin to have a dialogue and a discussion uh, so that we can think together about what we would all want? What, are our, what's, what do we have in common in terms of those shared visions? Um, most of the discussion these days is about individual uh, 
visions what people want, their own individual goals and how those goals may be conflicting with what other, other people want. Um, so we need to get beyond that and start creating a, a shared vision. We only do that by talking about it, by having a, a dialogue, a discussion. Um, the vision has to be flexible and evolving, so you're not going to get it totally right the first time. This is a process. It's not, it's not, it's not an end product, but it's a process. You have to continually think about what, um, what that vision of the future should be and revisit it and revisit it and revisit it as we learn more. So, and that's at least as important as the particular visions themselves. So we can characterize our current situation as a, a lack of a shared vision. We have all these individual goals. We have institutions that, that mediate between uh, autonomous individuals, or at least that's the way they're, they're conceived to be. And the, the institution's role is really to, uh, to mediate this conflict between people's reaching their, their individual goals. Shared envisioning implies that the institutions play a different role. Uh, the institution's role is to help us create this shared vision, and then to use that shared vision uh, to help uh, people to achieve their, their common goals and their, their individual goals. And so <clears throat> one way of, of also thinking about it is before this envisioning process occurs, um, people have their individual goals, they maybe have not thought through you know, what their visions are of the sustainable and desirable future. Um, their visions are narrow and vague and destroyed. Um, after some discussion, there's an intermediate stage, and eventually you can create a shared, a shared vision, an area of overlap. Uh, what do we all agree should be in that, uh, in that vision of the future? <coughs> We actually went through this process in a, in a workshop at, uh, at Oberlin College several years ago. We gave the work participated in, along with several other, we had about 40 people in this, uh, this seminar. And we gave them a wide variety of, of backgrounds. We gave them the task of um, creating that area of overlap. What is the, what do we agree on? What is the consensus about what we would like the world to be like Year 2100 in the U.S. in this case. We put it far into the future so that none of the people in the room would still be alive at that point. Um, so it wasn't their personal interest that they were talking about. It was the interest of their children and grandchildren. Um, and <clears throat> there's an amazing, you get an amazing amount of overlap when you cast the problem in that way. When people do attempt to all want uh, similar things. Things. What we largely disagree on are, are paths to get there. Um, so what we did was try to start to, start to write down and get, uh, get a picture, to paint a picture of what that world uh, would look like. There's a more detailed description of this, uh, of this website. Um, but these were the key elements, and we ended up uh, structuring it in in terms of the four types of capital that I mentioned before, uh, as well as uh, the worldview, or how the world, the vision about how the world works. <clears throat> and these were the elements of that, the, you know, the, to reconceive humans as a part of nature, not, not uh, apart from nature. That the, the goal is quality of life rather than uh, merely consumption. Most people can agree, can agree on that. Uh, that because of the material constraints of the real world, eventually we're going to require a, a steady state economy, not one that's materially growing. Uh, when that would happen is, a, is another question. Natural capital needs to be protected as an essential life support, uh, its life support functions. Built um, capital needs to run on renewable energy and natural capital. Emphasis again on quality rather than quantity. Um, humans, human capital, stable populations, and the pursuit of more meaningful and creative work in the future rather than simply working to make money to buy products and services. And that <coughs> social capital was an extremely important component of all of this. The primary source of 
productivity and well-being, and that we needed a return to a, a stronger form of democracy, where people actually did really have a say in how the, the system evolved. So, <clears throat> just to give you some, some hope that uh, these sorts of changes actually are, are happening. Uh, this is <coughs> data from a study by Paul Ray called The Cultural Creatives. Uh, he's, he's a uh, market researcher. They've been doing market surveys since the 60s. And they have classified or categorized people in the U.S. in these three categories based on a whole list of questions that they ask. And so it might be considered the, uh, the basic worldviews or visions of the, the components of the U.S. population. And he they break into these three categories. The moderates, who I would argue are the, the full world, the empty world vision, uh, sort of personified. Uh, the traditionalists, which are sort of self-explanatory, people who would like to go back to the way things used to be. And the cultural creatives, who are the ones who I think take on board more of the, this empty world uh, vision uh, that a sustainable and desirable future is, is really what they're after. Um, they're, they're sensitive to the, the, you know, all the, the things that we've been talking about. And what's really quite amazing about this graph is simply the magnitude and the rate of change of the cultural creatives. That, that now 25% roughly of the U.S. population. And in 1965, they were you know, less than less than five percent. Um, so all this talk, I think, ha that we've been engaged in over those years is, is having an effect. Um, but as I said, the missing element is still what's the uh, what is the goal? What does the goal look like? Um, uh, let's paint the picture of that sustainable and desirable future, and then I think we'll reach fairly quickly some sort of tipping point where um, a majority of the population then comes on board with that. that so the challenge for us, I think, as a society and for us in the seminar uh, is to create this shared vision of a sustainable and desirable future. Um, how do we do that? Uh, we're going to start by, by talking about it, by discussing it by putting our visions uh, out there on the table for, uh, for analysis and discussion, uh, by <clears throat> focusing on what we agree on rather than focusing on what we disagree on. And I'll try to, to, um, to maintain that <clears throat> perspective as we, as we go through. Uh, it's all too easy when you hear someone give a talk to say, yes, I agree with 99% of what you said, but there's one thing I disagree with. That's what you ask the question. Um, so our academic dialogue tends to be very debate-working and very sort of negative in that sense. How do we have a discussion that focuses on what we agree on and try to build on that, that sense of agreement? So I'll put this up again just to remind you who else will be here subsequent, <coughs> subsequent weeks. And I hope you all <coughs> come back to that and maybe spread the word a little bit wider. Uh, about this, uh, this seminar series and uh, have this broader discussion create a sustainable and desirable future. Thanks.